Ed Bates on the Barton organ. Welcome, everyone, to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Christina Hamilton. I'm the series director. Uh, greetings to all of those of you who are new among us today, especially our freshmen, entering freshman students, uh, and a welcome back to all of you returning students and fans. Wow, this is a low microphone for me today. Um, for those of you who are new to Penny Stamps, from the general public who have no idea what the Penny Stamps series is, I'll explain. Uh, the Penny Stamps series is a program of the University of Michigan Stamps School of Art and Design, which looks to present creators and innovators like our distinguished guests today uh, as a way for our students to connect directly with creative leaders. It takes place here at the Michigan Theater every Thursday, same time, same place. It's offered as a class to our undergraduate art and design students. Um, and it also functions as an open classroom for all of us. And so everyone is welcome to join. Uh, we come to you with a very dynamic roster of guests this fall, uh, the details of which are listed in the brand new calendar, which is out in the lobby. If you did not get one on the way in, uh, I believe we have folks that will be handing them out to you on your way out. Take a couple, give them to a friend, uh, and plan to be here every Thursday, 510, now through April. Uh, today, we are very pleased to present renowned, award-winning, iconic, I think you could say, uh, photographer Mary Ellen Mark, who brings us portraits and portrayals. I think it's very fitting to have Mary Ellen as our opening speaker for uh, a season which we are calling Portrayals. Uh, thinking about this, what makes us uniquely human is our ability to communicate our individual perceptions from the world around us. And creative folks do this through a language of their own that they design, be it verbal, be it visual, physical, musical, to describe or portray. And they reveal ideas and perspectives which illuminate human experience and connect us through deeper understanding. So as this season of Penny Stamp Speakers commences and folks share their perceptions and insights, I hope you can sit back, listen, and look beyond the boundary of yourself, your expectations, your preconceived notions, and be open to the world as perhaps you've never seen it before. Um, I want to thank our partners for their support in today's program, the Institute for Humanities and the Department of the History of Art, and of course our faithful series sponsors, Arts at Michigan and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. A couple of announcements, some hot cultural tips for you, which happen to coincide with the Penny Stamp series, next two speakers. Uh, next week, we will have Simon McBurney, known to most of you for his acting career in movies such as Harry Potter, Last King of Scotland, Tinkle, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, Golden Compass, currently the TV show The Borgias. But his real passion and his real artistic journey are through his theater company, Complicité, who is going to be embarking upon Ann Arbor, Tuesday of next week, and opening a show called Shun Kin at the Power Center through UMS on Wednesday of next week. Uh, so I highly recommend you get tickets to the show. It will be at the Power Center Wednesday through Saturday next week, and students, you get 50% off tickets. So, you should go see it. See it before Simon, see it after Simon, but see the show. Uh, the following week, we will host South African artist Mary Sabandi, whose work is in a number of places around campus and who has new work being created on campus. And tomorrow, there is an exhibition opening for her current exhibition at the Slusser Gallery on North Campus at the Art and Architecture Building. That will be from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock. This is truly extraordinary work. I advise you, come to the opening or at least come by the Slusser at another moment to see it. It is astounding. And she will talk, speak here in two weeks. We will have a question and answer period with Mary Ellen after her talk here today. We do not hold that in this theater. For those of you who are regulars, you know this. For those of you who don't know the building, you exit the theater, go left, go down a long corridor, and there's actually a second theater within the theater building called the screening room, and we will convene there directly afterwards for a question and answer period. Um, there are also, some of her books are for sale. We have Nicola's books in the lobby uh, with some books if you want to pick one up. And students who are registered for this as a class, hold your seats for just five minutes after her talk. We're going to have Bill Burgard take the stage, who is and he is going to explain to you how the procedures of getting credit for this class work. 
Okay, now, for a proper introduction of our guest today, I'm very pleased we have Stamps School Professor and Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, David Turnley. Thank you. It is my honor to be asked to introduce my colleague and dear friend, Mary Ellen Mark. I smiled as I enjoyed reading the first sentence of a biography written about Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen Mark was born in suburban Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and began photographing with a box brownie camera at age nine. She attended Cheltenham High School, where she was head cheerleader and exhibited a knack for painting and drawing. In the world of documentary photography and in the community of documentary, ph documentary photographers, Mary Ellen is known as one tough cookie who has dedicated her career to photographing the lives and dignity of the disenfranchised. Mary Ellen has been quoted speaking about her work with homeless, the mentally ill, and prostitutes. I feel an affinity for people who haven't had the best breaks in society. When they allow you, to in, when they allow you into the secret corners of their lives, they give you something you can, that you can never repay. I remember being invited with Mary Ellen and 100 of the best photographers in the world to fly together in 1987 to Moscow to work together on a book called A Day in the Life of the Soviet Union. As we traversed the Atlantic, I remember the excitement we all felt working alongside Mary Ellen with her beautiful braids and the inspiration of her intensity, her dedication, and the physical and emotional sacrifice that she gives of herself and the soulful work that she always brings back. In fact, for that project, Mary Ellen, in the midst of a country that spanned 11 time zones, chose to live among the blind in a school for the blind in Kiev in the Ukraine. As we, as we look at her photographs, we are disarmed that these are not blind nor Soviets, but rather beautiful human beings with souls that we are forced to acknowledge. It is my pleasure to introduce to you one of the great documentary photographers of all time and an American treasure. Thank you very much, Mary Ellen Mark. Um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here, and thank you, Christina, for inviting me. And thank you, David Turnley, one of the great photographers of all time, for that, for that lovely introduction. I, I really appreciate it. I photographed David and his brother, I think it was in 1990. I think that was one of the, the, the times that I was really inspired to photograph twins. And, <laughs> And he, he's a wonderful person and a great, great photographer. You're lucky to have him teach here, really, really lucky. So I, tonight, I think what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna go very, very fast when I show my slides. So I'm gonna show you bits and pieces of, of lots of different things that I've done throughout a long career. I started photographing when, when I was uh, 22 years old. Uh, I was a painting major at the University of Pennsylvania and then I went to the Annenberg School, and then I had a Fulbright to go to Turkey. And I went to, uh, this is one of the first really good pictures that I, that I took in, in Turkey. And uh, it was in Trabzon in Eastern Turkey. And this is the man that won the mustache contest in Turkey. <laughs> and that was my first experience at really wandering around and disciplining myself and to take pictures. And this is in Izmir in Eastern Turkey. And when I was in college, Bruce Davidson came to teach a course. It was like a workshop. And we, he gave us each assignments. And my assignment was to photograph Santa Claus. So I, I took a train to New York. And this is Santa Claus on his lunch break. <laughs> and I moved to New York after I returned from my Fulbright. And I would photograph all kinds of events. And I'm really a street photographer. That's how I started out. And, and I think if you can shoot on the street and shoot spontaneously, you can shoot anything. So all these years I've spent in New York just taking pictures. These are done in the, in the 70s in New York. This is, a, that's a nightclub comic. That's when 42nd Street was still really interesting. Um, it was a burlesque comedian. And when I first came to New York, it was during the Vietnam War. And there were lots of demonstrations going on for and against the war. 
It was very different taking pictures at that time because there weren't so many photographers on the street. Today, when you go out, because I still go out on the street now, you're really inundated with, with cell phones and video cameras and everything. But I could pretty much be by myself at that time. It's very different now. And I started doing assignments for magazines. And um, this was an assignment for Ms. Magazine in the early 70s on Appalachian women. And this is, in, this is in Hayden Lake, Idaho. This is done a little bit later in the, in the 80s um, in a group called the Aryan Nations. And one of the early ways that I earned money commercially was to work on film sets. And I was really lucky because in, in the late 60s, I got an assignment to work on a Fellini film. Um, it's one of the great filmmakers of all time. So this was on the Satyricon. And it was, that was very different then because you could walk around and work as a documentary photographer, just taking pictures. Now, I still work sometimes on film sets, but the work is much more commercial, and they really want something called one sheets, which is like portraits, and they're very defined, so it's really much more like doing advertising pictures. This is Louis Bunuel uh, during the filming of Tristana. And this was an assignment, um, a portrait assignment, and this is Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. And, and he was a very famous ventriloquist. And I, the uh, editor of the magazine said, I, we don't want any pictures with his dummy, no Charlie in the pictures. And when I went there, Edgar Bergen was really shy and embarrassed. And then his son said, but he has to be photographed with Charlie. So he went and he got the suitcase and Edgar Bergen leaned down and pulled Charlie out of it. And that was the moment, and they're just two frames, but that was the moment. Now, this is the Lone Ranger, Clayton Moore. Um, that was an assignment in the early 90s, um, an assignment that I thought of uh, on old cowboys. And he actually answered the door with that mask on. So. <laughs> he was very paranoid. <laughs> and David mentioned the, the Day in the Life series. And that was a great time to take pictures, because photographers would just go all together and you would have several days to take pictures. It was supposed to be done in one day, but I think everybody cheated and worked a couple of days. But this was, <laughs> this was in Barcelona in, in 1987 at a gypsy camp. And this was, uh, this was in a hospital in, in Torino in 1990. And one of the, when I first came to New York, it was a very, very different time for documentary magazine photography because the, the, it was, the magazines really loved documentary photography, and there was so much work to be done. It, it's not that way anymore. I mean, there's hardly any more documentary photography. It's more about celebrity now. And I, I suggested to Look Magazine to do a story on a hospital in England that was giving diminishing doses of heroin to drug addicts. So this was done in 1969 in London. And this was in Mexico. I teach in Oaxaca in Mexico. And it's still very much like this. This was done in the late 60s. And this is a trip that I took to Africa in 1973 with Peter Brook. This was an assignment for Life magazine uh, in 1988 um, in Sudan on cartoon of, on street kids, glue-sniffing kids. Sometimes it makes me really sad to look at these pictures because it was a time when you were constantly working and you could suggest all kinds of stories to magazines and they, they would consider them. This is another day in the life type of assignment in China in 1985. And this is just something, I do a lot of work on my own and this was done in northern Mexico in, in 2000. It's a very strange festival. Um, and you have to, in order to get these pictures, because the people baptize themselves in the mud bath, I had to go in that water and I was a little nervous that Someone would have my house of blood, and it's very precious. So. But no, no one pushed me in under. And this was actually, this is in, in Ireland. This was in 1991. And this is the, the place where I photographed David and Peter. So it's a special feeling for me. It's at a gypsy camp. And again, at a gypsy camp, a first communion in 1991. Gypsy Camp in 1991. And this is a, the assignment that, that, that David was talking about in, in, in Kiev. 
1987 at, at uh, this is not the school for the blind, but this is at a regular school, but this is the school for the blind in 1987. This was for Life magazine. This is in 1985 during the famine in Ethiopia, and it's in a birthing tent. I usually just like to go to one place, rather. So I found one camp in Coram, in in uh, in Ethiopia, and just spent the whole two weeks there at one camp. This is one of the earliest projects that I worked on, and it was really a personal project. It was in India in 1971, and uh, there were a lot of young people that were went there for either enlightenment or, or for drugs. And this is in, in, Go, in Bombay. And this is in Goa. And when I first went to India, one of the first things that I saw was Falkland Road. And it was a road in Bombay, where the, or Mumbai, called Mumbai today, uh, where, where the least expensive prostitutes lived and worked. And I swore I'd return there one day. And I did. In 1978, I went back there. And I spent three months photographing the prostitutes on Falkland Road. And the next year, I was thinking, what am I going to do after that assignment? It was so fantastic. So uh, I thought, well, I love animals, especially dogs, but I love animals. And I decided uh, I'd photograph street performers, which is a tradition that is passed on from generation to generation in India. This is a man that's taught his dogs to smoke. And this is the snake charmer teaching his son about snakes and the monkey trainer's daughter. And then I went back again to India and I photographed Mother Teresa's missions. And I went back another time, so I spent almost three months photographing the missions of charity in Calcutta. Uh, my favorite thing to do is to go back. And I think by going back to places, that's how I get my pictures. And people know you, and I feel more comfortable. And it just makes it much easier to work. And this is also, it's a shrine in India. This is the man who loved his tree. And this is in Banaras, which is one of my favorite cities in India, at the Burning Ghats. And I've always loved the circus. And there's nothing like the circus. I have no other place in the world that has circuses like India. And when I first went to India in the late 60s, I would always ask if there was a circus in town, whether it was in Bombay or Delhi or whatever. This is an early picture of, of a circus. And then I decided I was going to go back and really concentrate. So in, in 1990, 89, 90, I went back. I spent six months photographing 18 different circuses in India. That's Ram Prakash Singh and his, his beloved elephant, Shyama. And it was really interesting for me, the relationship between man and beast. Oh, that's Mira. She's looking, at, she's looking very suspicious, isn't she? And she bit me right after I took this picture. So <laughs> it has this really significance for me. And then the next year I went back to, to India to a different location with the same circus. And Arjun, her trainer, said, she's finally forgiven you. He, go, and, go and shake her hand and apologize. But she bit me. But I, so I said, oh, OK. So I went over. She was in a big training cage. And I went over there. And I put my hand in the cage to, you know, to, to shake her hand. And she took this very strange stance. And I, she started to run right at me. And I realized she's charging me. She wants my arm. And I pulled it out just in time. I never went near her again. <laughs> if you notice, most chimp trainers are missing fingers. You don't, don't trust chimps. So, and this is in the tents. You know, I, I, I was talking to, to David before, and I was saying, I think one of the advantages being a woman is that you really have access. You can, you can 
certain kind of access, that you can knock on a door and walk in. And certainly with, with the prostitutes and, and the circus, it was very much a girls or young girls and women's world. Most of the children were rented to the circuses by their families, were, were females. And so, because the male children were much more valued and are much more valued in India. So I could spend times in the tents. And that's Gloria and Raja. And I knew Raja from the time he was a baby and I was photographing in circuses and he remembered me. That's all he did. He just opened his mouth, but that was enough. <laughs> it's very dangerous. <laughs> but you see, I could just go into the, the tents when the children were napping, all females, and it was okay. I think it might have been harder for, for a male to do that. And then I also photographed in Mexico in, in the circuses. That's in Oaxaca where I teach, and that giraffe's name is Madonna. And this is, this, I shot this in four or five. I wanted to try and make it differently. This is on it, one of the day in life projects in uh, Hanoi, a circus in Hanoi. And actually, this is in New York. That's Anna Mae. And I had to bribe her. I was told definitely do not try and approach her unless you've given her a whole box of donuts. So otherwise she'll pick you up and throw you. So I came tiptoed and I gave her, she ate the whole box of donuts and then I could work with her. This is an early picture of an Acadian wedding. And that's Jeanette. Uh, uh, I photographed her. Uh, I saw her in Central Park. It's 1979 and I followed her throughout her pregnancy and was able to catch her when she went into labor. And then in the late 70s, or 1976 actually, I photographed in a mental hospital and I spent um, six weeks living in the hospital with the women. That's Lori. She stole our keys. Never forget that. Never put your keys down any place. That, that's Mary Frances. And she'd been in the hospital since she was 15 years old. And this was also another magazine story. There were such fantastic magazine stories to do. This is Harry Hessel, he's a window washer. This was in Miami Beach in the late 70s. And at that time, there were a lot of elderly people living there. Uh, there was a whole community of elderly, and a lot of them were, were survivors from concentration camps. This is also at, at, at St. Petersburg, at, at a, a home for the elderly. This was a magazine assignment that was my idea on gigolos, men that dance with women for money. A story on poverty. This was done for Fortune magazine in the 90s. It was urban and rural poverty. Poverty is actually quite hard to photograph. I mean, it, because it can be such a cliche and to try and find a way of looking at it that hasn't been looked at a million times before, it's challenging. I don't like cats. <laughs> I used to do some pictures for the New Yorker. They used a lot more photography a few years ago. And this was a, just pictures from New York. This was a, a project for a, a nonprofit on um, a, a shelter. And I decided to take a lot of pictures during Halloween. I shot it, also decided to shoot it with a large format camera just to give it a, another kind of presence. It's a mermaid. And that's Halloween in Texas. These are, this is one of the last assignments from, from life on a mall in Ohio. And I was lucky because the weekend I went there, Mickey and Minnie were there and people would line up for, and it was, uh, Disney, after begging and begging, agreed to let me shoot them, so. And proms, um, I've always been interested in uh, rituals, American rituals. First I photographed them in 35 millimeter, and then medium format, medium format. More pictures for the New Yorker. This is a hotel in Las Vegas for celebrity lookalikes. 
this was a, this was a project for um, Texas Monthly magazine on small town rodeos. It was done in the early 90s. This was a pro project for the Nature Conservancy. This was a project for a book on, on when a child dies. An assignment for Life magazine on a leprosy hospital in uh, Carville, Louisiana. And it shows you must get releases because, of course, when you go to a hospital like that, they only want to show you everything is perfect. And it didn't look like a leprosy hospital. And I saw her, and I decided I'm going to, I'm going to get, take her picture. So I went in and I explained, because she was blind, what I wanted to do. She said, OK. She signed a release. And I took the picture. And of course, the hospital was furious, but I had a release, so there was nothing they could do. This is the Dam family. It's a story I did for Life magazine. In 19, uh, this was, picture was taken in 1987, and we followed them for like 10 days. They lived in their car. And then I decided I wanted to go back, and so I went back in 1994, and I found them again, and they were living in the high desert outside of Los Angeles, about three hours outside. And that's Nick, that's Jesse, and that's Nick. And um, when I left, I took Nick with me, and I gave him to a friend of mine in Los Angeles. And this was taken when I went back. And this is one of the hardest pictures that I think I had to take, and I, but I took it. And that's Chrissy. That's how Jesse looked when I first went back. And he waited for me outside the canyon where they lived. Another story on poverty, growing up poor in Portsmouth, Ohio. A story on poverty. A story on problem children for, for life. This is a, this was never published. It's Amanda and her cousin Amy. Story on problem children. This is a project I did myself on twins, and I started working with the 20 by 24 Polaroid camera. And um, I, I went to Twinsville. I don't know if you've heard of Twinsville, but they have a twins festival. First I shot it with a 35 millimeter, then medium format, then 4 by 5 and then I decided to return and to photograph it with the 20 by 24 camera. This is Riley and Emily Schultz, and they're four years old. And, and um, Emily's kind of a bully, and she makes Riley wear her tutu. This is Heather and, and Kelsey, and, and they have over 100 Barbie dolls. This is a story that I did called Streetwise. And, my husband made a film out of the story, and it was the beginning of a long time working relationship because we often, I do a story and then he makes a film, or we do it at the same time. And that's Rat and Mike. It was about street kids in, in Seattle, Washington. It was done in 1983. And that's Lily with her doll. And that, that's Erin, or Tiny, with her nickname. And that was during Halloween in Seattle in 1983. And we followed her over the years. We continue to follow her. And we're going to go back and make a film about her now because she has 10 children now. So we've been following her since 1983. That's, this was taken in 1999. That's with her mother. That's with two of her children. That was taken in 2003. And that's two of her children in 2003. That's tiny. I'm going to show you some pictures from prom. Because in, I guess it was, I, went, I decided that I wanted to photograph proms, bec but photograph it with a 20 by 24 camera. It was a really complicated project because I had to go all over the country. It took four years to do with this big camera, and I had to really plan it and get permission. It's very hard to get into high school proms. So this, this was Los Angeles. This is a... Uh, Palisades Charter High in Los Angeles. That's at my high school. That's the high school that I went to, Cheltenham High School in Philadelphia, where I was head cheerleader. That's also my high school. <laughs> this is a very fancy school. This is a fancy school. Um, it's called Harvard Westlake. It's in it's in Los Angeles, and a private school. Again, Harvard Westlake. This is, uh, this is uh, Westlake, but it's in, it's in uh, Austin, Texas. It's not a private school, but it might as well be. Very wealthy suburb of, of, 
And, and this, is, this is in St. Michael's Academy in, 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 in New York. A, pr a private Catholic school, but not a fancy school. This is, uh, this is St. Michael's Academy again. This was my favorite school, Malcolm X Shabazz, where the kids design their own clothes. This is Tottenville High School. This is in Staten Island. That's my high school, Cheltenham. That's Tottenville again. We made a film that, that went with this, and uh, this, uh, the, when, the film came out in the book where the kids really become alive. This is at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They also have a prom. It's a, a really well-known cancer hospital in New York. This is, this is in, in Houston, Texas. This is at MacArthur High School, which might as well be Mexico. It's so Mexican. Texas, of course. That's in Austin, Texas. Again, this, this is at um, Westlake High School in Austin for di this is disabled kids that go to the prom. MacArthur. That's MacArthur. That's Malcolm X Shabazz. So you notice how he's showing his bling. They, they love that watch. That's in Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville. That's Tottenville. Now I'm going to show you something. It's interesting because one of the things that I, you never know in this, this work, and last year I had the best assignment I've ever had, and I, I, it, it's so strange that it came out of nowhere, just when I was thinking, oh, documentary photography is no more, and it was from Novartis. And I'm going to show you some, I put together a small portfolio from it, and then I'm going to show you two short films. Um, it was for the pharmaceutical company called Novartis, and it was run by, the, the, run by a man named Dr. Vasala. And he loved photography, he loved it. He loved documentary photography. And so every year he would hire a photographer to do any project they wanted to do, health-related health project. And so I was really so lucky. I got, I got the assignment, not this past year, the year before that. And when I went to see him, he said, what would you like to do? And I thought, well, I think I'd like to do a theme on pediatric health care. So, and then m my husband would, would make films about pediatric health care. So he said, fine, just go and do it. And I mean, I've never had something that was so free and such an amazing chance to do your own work. And that, it takes that kind of person that would really believe in you and let you do your own work. So. I went to several countries. So this was in Iceland. In Iceland, I photographed a camp for disabled children. They have a fantastic program for, for the disabled in Iceland. And I did a book there some years ago about a, a disabled school, a school for disabled children. So, this girl's name is Sola, 
and she was a punk rocker. I mean, she, tattoos and just a fantastic person. And she had profound cerebral palsy. And I photographed her a lot. I just couldn't get enough pictures of her. She was so amazing. And she hated to wear shoes and she kept, she had electric wheelchair. She kept hitting the wall and breaking her toes. And she was like, so I found, she, she only liked to wear black. So I found a pair of great black hard sneakers that she was happy to wear. So we became really great friends. And for the past couple of years, when I teach the workshop, I always assign one of my students to photograph her. And she, she's like, she told her grandparents, oh, I, this summer I'm really busy, I have to, because Mary Ellen's coming and I'm gonna be photographed again. You know, it was just so touching for me. She's a beautiful person. And when we make, we make a blur book for the workshop and she's on the cover. And she doesn't know yet, but she's gonna be so thrilled. She's an amazing person. Amazing, amazing, amazing person. This little girl has a disability. It's a syndrome that she's from the Faroe Islands that that's only exists in the, in the Faroe Islands. This little boy I've known since he was a very young boy because when I did the book, I, I met him. In Los, Angeles, in Los Angeles, we went to Children's Hospital and I know the head doctor there and it was very hard to get for a pharmaceutical company to get a hospital to let you in because in America, a hospital, because they don't want to show favoritism towards one drug company. But I've worked a lot with this particular doctor, so he trusted me and he let me in. And it was just amazing. And you'll see, I'm not going to say much more about this, these pictures because you'll see the film. The, one, the film I'm going to show you is about this hospital. They used, this is the picture they used for the cover, and it's a very tough picture, but it shows you the, you know, how strong this, this, you know, company president was to have the guts to use a picture like that on the cover of an annual report. She wanted to be a circus performer. So we really got along. <laughs> In India, we did uh, heart surgery, both catheter and open heart surgery. And we went to Ames, uh, Ames Hospital, which is run by a guru named Alma. I don't know whether you've heard of her. She's a hugging guru. I'm not a guru type person, but this woman, the hospital is amazing. And what she's done is incredible. It's a state of the art, wonderful, wonderful hospital in Southern India. It's in Kochi. In Mexico, I, I, we didn't make a film, but I followed some doctors that went up in the mountains and the kids danced for him. And then I photographed a woman that I know that has a school for children with Down syndrome because she has a daughter with Down syndrome. And of course, we did the vet. In Kenya, we did malaria. That's actually Burkitt's lymphoma. It's not the malaria. But we focus most, mostly on malaria. In Ukraine, we did eye surgery. In China, we did a big general hospital, and then we did a, a school for children with autism. And we went to Guiyang, which was really interesting, because it wasn't like going to be Beijing or Shanghai. It was a really more, they weren't very, I didn't see one Western tourist there the whole time. So now I'm going to show you two films. 
One from Ukraine. They're short films. They're about five minutes. And one from um, Los Angeles. I'm happy. It gives me force. It gives me enthusiasm. It gives me love in my speciality because it is a wonderful thing. I have some cases when the parents were the first who say, oh, something wrong with the eyes of my child. The first thing which the mother look very carefully into the face of a child. And of course it is eyes. When Dasha was born, she was put in me at once. And uh, she opened her eyes, and I saw that she had a problem. It was seen. Something strong with her eyes. Cataract of both eyes. Microphthalmia of her left eye. Mixed nystagmus and high level of myopia. She has residual vision of light perception, and now she can see something. And we have operated both eyes and to remove cataract and remove big pieces of glass from both eyes. We were making preparations for the Easter celebration. We built a fire. There were some pieces of glass in the fire. They exploded. His sight was taken away by this moment. He says, don't cry, mom. Everything will be fine. He's getting better. His left eye already can see a little. Today, he had a surgery for his right eye. They were taking his stitches out. It is always so hard to wait. 
every time you have to think, do you do it well or no? The procedure, of course, very delicate, and their movements is very little. The size of incision may be one millimeter or even less than one millimeter. For me to make this procedure, you have to be very quiet, very calm. The surgeon operate not by heavy hands, by the mind. different from before she got sick. Now she is very independent. She's feisty. She's always been a girly girl. Always wants to be wearing a dress. When she had her hair, she wanted her hair done, either ponytail or braided, but she always wanted to look nice. I dress her and she just go look in the mirror and she model pose just by looking to herself. That's funny, because she's so little. And now it's even funnier because she acts like if she has hair, she brushes it. And she just loves to dance and she sings. It's just, just I don't know, I don't know. She just has something there. Oh my God, oh my God. Yoselin is a very, very special girl. My kiss, where's my, what? How are you, sweetie? Oh, you look so beautiful. She has a rare condition. Are you okay? Uh -huh. Oh, that is the bilateral Wilms tumor. And presented to us at a very advanced stage, both with her uh, two kidneys involved by disease, as well as with lung metastasis. Since the beginning, she was very spunky. She had that willingness to fight. We went through therapy and she was always there with a smile, with a big hug, with a big kiss to me. And that's what make the day by day of my life so bearable. You look so beautiful. You doing okay? What happened with your finger? I became a pediatrician because after training in Brazil, and having trained as adult hematologist, I realized that treating kids are much more fun. Like a snowman. A snowman? He's gonna melt, it's too hot outside. Cancer in, in children is something that we encounter day by day. And what I decided for my life is that my job is to help them get through their journey. And once I realized that I don't decide where the journey ends, that my 
relationship with the parents, with the children, is just to help them through, it became easier. It became much simpler for me to be able to deal with the day-by-day -day challenges because I don't define the end result. I'm here to help them go through the challenges of their day-by-day. -day. Dr. Marcio is a very nice doctor. The first day we got here, we met him. He was actually getting ready to get married. He left whatever he was doing and came to talk to us. This is a carrot. This is a carrot. Now you have a nose. Bye. We were scared, afraid of knowing anything about her sickness. He just comforted us, explained to us step by step the process of her treatment. It is hard because she's our only daughter. The pain of dealing with kids, how hard it is to give a diagnosis to a family, how hard it is to look at a child, a adolescent, a family, and to give the news that you, you or your loved one has cancer. And what hasn't changed is that despite of all our improvement, the pain of giving a diagnosis, the pain of sharing our failures, our inability to cure them, our ability to offer alternative or therapies that will secure long-term outcomes. That pain hasn't changed. And as long as that pain is uh, within me, it's a reason for me to continue to practice and continue to try to help my children and my families. So, um, so I want you to think about any questions that you might have, and we, we, you'll have a chance in the screening room. We can talk about also the difference between film and photography. Film's much harder. I, I don't think I could ever be a, really be a filmmaker. Martin makes the films, and I, I contribute, but, but he's really the filmmaker. Um, we can talk about that, or any questions that you might have. Um, we'll have time to, 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 to answer them. Um, and you were a great audience, and I want to thank you very much. And, and thank Christine again, and thank David. And it's a great university, and I'm honored to be here.